All right, you see the screen? Yep, okay. I see the screen and we are now recording, so I think we can get started. So thank you all very right. much, Ellen, for agreeing to give a build a cell seminar and it's all yours. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start by thanking Kay for uh, organizing this uh, seminar series and uh, giving me the opportunity to present some of the work from my lab. It's a real great pleasure to, to speak here. Um, so I was asked by Kay to, to give some background by myself, but I'll keep it very simple. Um, so I did my undergraduate degree uh, from the University of British Columbia in biochemistry. Uh, and then I moved to uh, UC Berkeley to do my uh, PhD work with Dan Fletcher. So I study uh, cell skeleton membrane interaction uh, in, a, in a in vitro reconstitution system uh, for my for my graduate work. And then I moved to San Diego to do my uh, postdoc with uh, Sandy Schmidt and Galveston User, uh, looking at uh, quantitative cell biology uh, of, of endocytosis, of clacton media In 2012, I moved to Michigan and started my own group. Uh, so I've been there for close to nine years now. Um, and, uh, and you might notice that my, my lab, you know, my primary affiliation is mechanical engineering. And one of the first things you might ask is what, how, how the hell did I, you know, um, you know, become an ME. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and, 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 and you know, uh, begin my seminar and you hopefully you will see uh, in the first slide sort of um, describing uh, the motivation of my lab's work and actually read ties well with uh, cell mechanics and, and, and uh, mechanical biology. So, um, so, so as I, as I, as I uh, alluded to earlier, I'm, I'm in the mechanical engineering part and partly because of my longstanding interest in uh, looking at how forces uh, are, um, uh, or how forces impact cell functions and cell physiology. Um, and so my broad interest is actually try to understand how cells uh, sense and respond to any extracellular stimuli. And, and to me, one of the key stimuli that cells would have to sense is mechanical forces. So this is a, a, a depiction of a uh, sort of uh, paradigm in mechanical biology where you have different type of uh, mechanical forces, uh, such as shear stress, strain forces, extracellular matrix rigidity, and that all impacts certain cell function. Okay, so cell functions that we're primarily interested in are uh, cell migration and endocytosis. And uh, in, in the middle part, this mechanical sensor is something that is uh, relatively, let me just change my pointer, uh, that is relatively uh, unknown uh, from, from, a, from, a, you know, from a resource standpoint. So we're interested in looking at how these mechanical sensors actually sense uh, the mechanical stimuli, the physical stimuli, and ultimately govern cell function. So this is the overarching interest of my group. And we study uh, a bunch of different things within this context. Um, and you'll hear a little bit about mechanical sense and ion channel. We have a bunch of cell biology work looking at endocytosis of different, um, uh, you know, caro protein as well as the dynamics of the process. Uh, we're very interested in, in, uh, in the nucleus uh, in recent years and looking at how uh, mechanical forces might alter gene expression. Uh, another process we're uh, interested in is, is cell migration. Um, so, so, so then you might, uh, you know, think about, okay, so I have a cell biophysics background and we're looking at single cells. Uh, why am I interested in building uh, synthetic cells? So I want to um, uh, sort of draw your attention to, to my fascinations about uh, building synthetic cells is we all come from a single cell, right? A, a, a uh, you know, a embryo essentially. So we have a, uh, a, a um, uh, an egg that basically differentiate into many, many different cell types. Uh, so roughly in the human body, we have about 200 cell types, roughly about 35 trillion cells. And that all come from a single cell at the very, very beginning, right? And um, so what I'm going to share with you today are uh, two aspects of my lab's work that revolve around making uh, two particular cell types, right? So the question I asked myself when we started out building synthetic cells, what kind of cell type do we want to build, right? What are the, uh, what are the cells that we're interested in? So you hear a little bit about platelets and you hear a little about neurons. And, um, but what, what I want to frame the talk to uh, today is, is really drawing your attention on a, on a um, primary technology that we use in our lab, which is, uh, which is uh, based on self-free expression. I think this community uh, here knows about, a lot about this. Um, but to me, what's fascinating about uh, you know, any organism is that every cell are uh, able to produce protein. Right? So all cells are translationally active. And, and, uh, and the fact that you can extrapolate the cytoplasm of the cell and uh, basically uh, use it to, to as, a, uh, as, a, as a protein uh, producing machinery to me is very, very powerful. So we utilize cell-free uh, lysate for both basic and applied studies. And you'll see this context uh, come out multiple times here. 
So my, my big um, uh, you know, interest uh, in the synthetic cell area uh, is to try to um, you know, build uh, these cell-like system that can take different type of inputs, you know, the same type of inputs that your single cell in your body uh, would uh, sense and respond to. And we know our cells can actually produce a variety of different outputs, including shape changes, uh, enzymatic activity, and secretion. And a synthetic cell uh, would look something like this, where you have a, uh, a compartment, right, that is bounded by a, a interface and most likely uh, a lipid bilayer uh, structure, encapsulating uh, soluble proteins. Uh, but importantly, there are also uh, membrane proteins that are on the surface, right? And these are the proteins that are uh, important for mediating uh, sensory of, of uh, synthetic cells. Uh, so they allow the, the, the cells, or the synthetic cell in this case, to sense uh, the different type of inputs. Um, so, uh, so to me, a central challenge in building synthetic cell is, is how to get uh, these synthetic cell to sense things, right? So uh, and in order to sense uh, extracellular stimulus or extracellular information, we need to reconstitute uh, functional membrane proteins. And uh, so, so a lot of the work that we, we do in the lab uh, involves, you know, uh, creating a strategy to reconstitute membrane proteins and study their functions and ultimately using them to build uh, synthetic cells that can function a certain way. Um, so uh, Vincent de uh, and I uh, had a, had a uh, annual review article recently where we described, you know, uh, the latest of, of bottom-up uh, biology and this TXCL, the transcription translation, uh, is an important uh, piece of this. So uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, um, with, with the system. Uh, and essentially, we, we do need to consider compartment, and this can be a uh, different type of, uh, I would say, volume can be utilized, uh, can be used. Uh, in, in a TXTL reaction, ranging from large vessel to test tube and, and well plates to microfluidics and liposomes. Um, and the synthetic uh, cell essentially uh, works at the level of, of encapsulating into these uh, picoliter size compartment. In, uh, and this is where my lab uh, spends our, most of our effort uh, in. And um, so, so uh, you know, v Vincent's lab has developed these uh, very powerful bacterial systems. My lab is primarily interested in, in mammalian uh, uh, cell free expression systems. So we, we take uh, HeLa cell lysate. Uh, these can be either commercially available or something we synthesize in the lab. Uh, we supplement this with a, a, uh, just a soluble fragment of an enzyme GAT34. Uh, and this is the enzyme that essentially dephosphorylate. Uh, the the uh, the translational factor uh, you know IF two alpha and this actually for promote as a typo it's actually translation um, and we also supplement with T seven R N polymerase so um, and and, uh, and then you know if you add a piece of DNA uh, with T seven promoter along with uh, certain buffers you can actually recapitulate the protein uh, synthesis um, uh, productions using a mammalian system. Uh, so here is a simple play reader uh, experiment showing if you add a piece of DNA with encoding GAP, you get a very robust production of GAP over a few hours. Um, and obviously, if you don't add any DNA, there's nothing. So, uh, so, so I'm going to switch gear and talk about uh, focusing really on, on membrane proteins um, and, uh, and, and, and sort of uh, hopefully illustrate to you the power of using a mammalian cell-free system for uh, studying membrane proteins. And uh, sort of coming back to our main interest in mechanical transduction, we have uh, you know long-standing interest in this sort of uh, uh, um, process itself. But uh, essentially, uh, you know, when forces apply extracellularly, the force is transmitted, um, you know, through the cell skeleton ultimately to the nucleus. And for the nucleus to respond to this, there is actually a, pro uh, a protein complex called uh, the link complex that essentially mediates this force transmission. And the link complex is composed by these protein called the sum proteins. And uh, the sum proteins illustrated here. So this is the outer nuclear membrane and this is the inner nuclear membrane. The internal domain of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the sum protein interacts with lamin, nuclear lamin. And the uh, C-terminus is the sun domains that interact with uh, cash peptide uh, or cash proteins uh, such as nesperins. So this, this complex is important for the mechanical communication uh, for a cell. Uh, and, and sort of uh, the link complex and for the linker of nucleus cell skeleton and cell skeleton. Um, I've already talked about uh, some proteins and, uh, you know, so if you look at the current work that's been done in, in, uh, in the area of, uh, you know, link complex, um, any of the biochemical studies have been using a soluble fragment of, of, of some proteins, okay? Uh, partly because it's very difficult to purify uh, these transmembrane protein and reconstitute that into a lipid bilayer. 
And this is a, a very interesting complex because you know, essentially the whole complex had to sit across two lipid bilayers. So we essentially asked uh, if we could use our self-re-expression system, the Mendelian self-re-expression system to express full length sun protein. And can we use it to study uh, some new features of, 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 this, uh, of, of these sun proteins? Um, so let me uh, quickly uh, share with you uh, some of the uh, methods for, for uh, reconstituting membrane proteins. And many of you probably know about uh, uh, giant linear vesicles. So you can produce giant linear vesicle from a, a process called electroformation uh, by applying electrophil on a, on a, uh, on a film that is, uh, lipid film that is dry onto substrates and then basically applying optimally uh, current through the, uh, uh, through the substrates. And, uh, and there's a, also a method called gel assisted spontaneous swelling that applies, uh, essentially dry the film on a, a, a gel, in this case, an agrose gel. Uh, and then you can take uh, proteoliposomes. Um, I think this also applies to the GV formation as well, that you can take proteoliposome, dry it down on a, on a substrate and then swallow it uh, to get basically uh, member proteins incorporating the GVs, um, both using the spontaneous swelling as well as the uh, electroformation method. So these are the, I would say, more of a conventional method for reconstituting membrane proteins. Um, and, uh, and, and sort of an alternative approach I would propose is to use self-expression system. Uh, and this is a work that we did in collaboration with Vincent that uh, I'll also talk a little bit um, about later. Uh, but essentially, we can incorporate membrane protein using self-expression. Uh, and this is a bacterial self-expression expressing a a bacterial membrane protein called MSCL, which is a mechanosensitive uh, channel. And the detail of this, I'll, I'll cover this in, uh, later. Um, but the idea is that we can perhaps use uh, in vitro uh, transcription translation to, uh, to essentially synthesize membrane protein. Um, in this particular example, uh, this MSCL actually opens upon uh, mechanical tension, so on the, on the bilayer. And if you encapsulate a fluorescent dye into this uh, uh, vesicle, uh, the dye will leak out of the lumen, uh, essentially uh, you know, demonstrating the, the, the functionality of the vesicle uh, of, the, of this, uh, yeah, of this, uh, the GV here. So if you don't have any MSCL, the fluorescent dye is stably uh, trapped within the um, the GUV, and if you do have MSCL subjecting the, uh, the GUV to the hypoosmotic shock, then you'll actually see the dye escape out of the, out of the vesicle. Um, so, so that is, that is nice. So, so then, um, so we wanted to use the system to study the, the sun, uh, the sun proteins. And one of the ways that we could uh, reconstitute is using, um, you know, deposit this, uh, 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 you know, um, reconstitute member protein on the silica bead. So, uh, if you take a glass bead, you can deposit um, SUVs on the glass bead. So uh, using a special uh, procedure, we generate something called a super template. And this is a support lipid bilayer with excess reservoir. So all that means is that there's extra membrane that covers the surface of the, of the, uh, of the bead. And then we can um, add this lipid coated bead to a self-expression -re uh, reaction, uh, incubated for some amount of time. And if the reaction is successful, then you have incorporation of the membrane protein into the, uh, the, the lipid coated beads. So, um, and just to remind you the some protein, uh, the, the way we, we uh, carry out our study is we fuse a GAP to the N terminus of, of sun. And the C terminus has a sun protein that uh, essentially interacts with the, uh, with the, with the cache uh, proteins. So there are two possible orientations of insertion. Okay, so uh, in one scenario, you can imagine the end terminus when the proteins are made is inserted into the space between the bead and the bilayer, as uh, shown in the schematic. Uh, in this case, when you um, then add a protease um, uh, called protease here, it can digest anything that's extracellular or extra uh, vesicle, right? So, so outside of the outside of the membrane here, and then basically you'll you'll, you'll cleave all these uh, parts, and, and you have the GAP remain. There's an uh, alternative uh, orientation uh, in the reconstitution so that the, um, the N-terminal uh, EGAP is exposed to the solvent. In this case, if you then treat it with uh, a protease, then you will actually lose the fluorescence. So this is nice um, to verify the orientations of the, uh, of, of the membrane protein. And I should point out that uh, if you do a biochemical reconstitution with you know, the, the electroformation method, or the, um, the gel assisted uh, uh, hydration method I mentioned in the previous slides, uh, you actually likely get a very random orientation of the membrane protein, partly because when you purify a protein, there's actually no 
orientation, uh, uh, prefer orientations from a, a purified membrane protein. So when you incorporate this in the membrane, they generally don't have a, a uniform uh, orientation. So we thought this method of, of in vitro reconstitution can actually uh, you know, overcome this uh, limitation and give you uh, a, a, a sort of consistent orientation. So, um, so first of all, uh, uh, we reconstituted these uh, um, you know, these sun proteins into the membrane, and this is a uh, showing you the GAP uh, on the super template. If you don't have uh, a bead, or so if you don't if you don't have a membrane, you just have the bead itself. It doesn't actually uh, show any GAP. Um, so here. Uh, we can constitute both the full length sun one as well as sun two. Um, at this point, I want to just um, describe a little bit more about uh, what we know about sun one and sun two proteins. So uh, these proteins have, are really difficult to study. And um, uh, and previously, what's known about sun one is that it has two transmembrane domains. Okay, and and this is uh, somewhat peculiar because if you have two transmembrane domains, you cannot imagine a scenario where you have the N and C that basically crosses the uh, the inner nuclear membrane, right? Because uh, you have two two passes, one goes up and the other goes down. So this is already a, a strange, um, uh, I would say, uh, topology based on this, what we know about uh, the Sun-1 protein. And Sun-2 only has a single uh, transmembrane domain. So we wanted to explore the topology of this membrane uh, protein a little bit more. And, uh, but, uh, so first of all, um, we, we turn to this uh, protease digestion assay that I introduced. Uh, if you uh, purify uh, GAP and then put it on a nickel NTA uh, lipid coated bead uh, within 15 minutes, the uh, the GAP is completely digested. You know, so basically this is a, a viable assay. If you have anything that's uh, outside the bead, it can be digested with uh, with protease. Now, if you do the same experiment with someone in Sun 2, you will see that after 15 minutes, the fluorescence you know retain uh, are, are completely the same. So what that suggests is that. Uh, the, the, the protein insertion is that the, the N-terminal GAP is uh, protected from uh, the solvent. So basically it's on the inside of the, of the bilayer. So we can quantify this and you can see that uh, both of these um, um, uh, it did not really reduce um, the, the, the levels of fluorescence after uh, protein digestion. So the C-terminal sun domains are actually so far exposed, right? Um, so, so then we, we decided to actually look into the topology a little bit more, and this is the full length sun protein I showed you earlier. And uh, it turns out that uh, when you, uh, uh, so that we, we can actually make a truncation, so removing all the uh, the transmembrane domain and basically have a, a, a nucleoplasmid domain of someone and also generate a, a luminal domain of someone, right? So we will predict that both of these would be soluble. Um, and then if you take a look at uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the ND, which is the nuclear uh, plasma domain, we actually see robust association of the sun uh, protein, the sun one protein with the bead. So this is strange because we have already truncated off the transmembrane domain, but yet it's still associated with the membrane. So what that tells you is that there's probably additional uh, transmembrane region or hydrophobic region that is, that is present within this, uh, within this uh, um, uh, nuclear plasma domain. In the in the LD, the luminal domain is um, has no fluorescence, and this is comforting because it, it doesn't have any it's it's, it's soluble basically um, uh, from this. So we took the um, the ND domain. So this is what we, we, I showed up before, uh, and we actually ran an additional uh, uh, test looking for or this is a computational tool to look for hydrophobic regions, and we actually identified two more regions that are hydrophobic in nature. And we decided to generate uh, two additional mutants, one cleaving on one of the hydrophobic region and the other one cleaving both of these. And then we can do the same experiment. Uh, and hopefully you can see um, that if you uh, take the full, uh, the full uh, ND, which is uh, this um, uh, 1 to 364, uh, the GAP is present. But when you uh, take out, um, sorry, 164 is, is the second one. So when you remove one of the hydrophobic regions, we still bind to the membrane. Um, and then uh, if you take out both of them, then it doesn't associate with the membrane at all. Okay, so it tells you that one of them, this is still associated with the membrane. Um, right, so we can apply this, um, uh, this proteodigestion acid again, and with the, uh, with the first um, uh, truncation that we removed just one of the hydrophobic regions, we can see that this is still associating with the membrane pretty robustly, this um, truncated uh, nucleoplastic domain. And, um, and based on this sort of deduction, uh, this is sort of the topology of someone uh, that we, we came up with. So you have the sun domain that is uh, luminal, you know, on, on the 
on the C-terminal side that is that will engage with the uh, the cache protein. And then we have the first two transmembrane uh, domain that is uh, that we know from before. And then we'll have to have a hydrophobic region, okay? And followed by, is there two regions, remember, that we identified for uh, that have hydrophobicity uh, nature. And one of them is a, is a peripheral associated uh, uh, um, uh, region and the other one is actually a transmembrane region. So this is the only topology that will satisfy all the, uh, the, the data that we have we have uh, we have shown, um, and, and still give you uh, C terminus and N terminus at opposing side of the uh, inner nuclear membrane. All right, so um, so 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 that's good. So we kind of figure out something new about this sun protein uh, orientation, and um, and then we want to know if this uh, some proteins are actually functional. So as I mentioned earlier, these some proteins will bind to uh, cache uh, proteins, and cache proteins are are um, uh, there's a piece of cache protein that is uh, essentially um, the part that will bind to some protein, and we can uh, synthesize it as a cache peptide. Um, and the cache peptide has this last four amino acid uh, three prolines in a in a uh, in a tyrosine here that uh, basically if you mutate it, it, it doesn't bind to the to the uh, to the sun anymore. So here, if you uh, look at the wild type uh, fluorescent label cache peptide, it binds to both sun one and sun two. And if we use the mutant uh, cache peptide, it no longer binds to these uh, uh, the, the sun. So uh, this demonstrates that um, these sun proteins are actually functional; that they're able to bind to uh, to cache. Right. So so that was sort of the the first part of the talk, just trying to give you a sense of what. Um, uh, you know, um, the power of reconstituting membrane protein using a mammalian self-free expression system and where we're able to uh, uh, demonstrate some uh, new um, understanding of, 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 of some uh, proteins in, this, uh, in the context of a link complex. Um, so the second part I want to, um, I guess, sort of uh, has a couple pieces of, of talking about, uh, you know, the synthetic uh, platelet idea, but also uh, showing you how we can apply this uh, reconstitution membrane protein into building a synthetic cell. So here I want to, uh, one of the, the major focus in my lab is to uh, ask how forces can um, be used as an input uh, to synthetic cells and how it can regulate some process, uh, in this case, uh, secretion, you know, so secreting of uh, anything inside the cell to, to inside a synthetic cell to outside. Um, so questions, can we build a synthetic cell that couples a mechanical into, input to a biochemical output so, um, so I decided not to talk about the uh, synthetic platelet, uh, sort of artificial platelet uh, in its full form, but just to tell you that um, uh, what we have conceived is a, is a strategy that uh, takes multiple modules of uh, building a synthetic cell. So if you combine these modules together, uh, we, we envision that we can build a, a artificial platelet. So uh, this slide essentially sort of summarizes the kind of modules that one would need in order to make this happen. Um, so the synthetic uh, or artificial platelet looks something like this, where you have a, a, a basically a vesicle that has moiety that can bind, that has more uh, that has uh, small vesicles and the lumen of the of the uh, of the artificial platelet that can be secreted to the outside, and this is the function of that. And and we also have proteins that are mechanical sensitive, so you can sense the mechanical environment of um, uh, and, and actually use it as an input to uh, essentially. Uh, trigger the coagulation cascade of a uh, uh, that that you will find in a natural place. So that's sort of the general concept. And uh, decided not to talk about this in detail because it was, uh, you know, we have an article that described that concept. But uh, the key point here is that in order to build a synthetic cells, I uh, you know I think um, I strongly believe that you need to take a modular approach. That um, you know uh, building everything from scratch means that you have to uh, set certain milestones and 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 and, and uh, be able to uh, essentially piece things together. So one of the modules is this vesicle attachment. Uh, another module is, is uh, creating these compartmentalized units. So uh, you, you using uh, vesicle encapsulation. Uh, I already talked about the use of a HeLa cell-free system for protein production. And then particularly important for the artificial plate is the use of uh, vesicle fusion as a method of secretion. And this is uh, important in this particular type of cells or artificial cells that we like to build. So. Um, uh, so I wanted to just uh, show quickly the kind of uh, core technology that we use for encapsulations. For many, many years, my lab was using this uh, double motion template vesicle uh, technique. So it basically consists of uh, a series of um, uh, glass capillaries. So there's a square capillary with two 
uh, pull glass capillary, uh, and you have the interface that uh, is an aqueous solution, you know, so it would be your self relysate. Uh, and then on the middle phase, you have an oil that uh, dissolves uh, uh, phospholipids, and, and this is a volatile oil that can evaporate, so you essentially end up getting a bilayer vesicle. And then you have the outer phase that's also aqueous, so you generate this double motion of water, oil, water. And my lab has more uh, recently been using a, another technique called sea dice, and I don't have an illustration for this, but it's actually pretty uh, powerful. And we kind of switch over to uh, primarily using uh, using sea dice for for generating uh, vesicles. Um, uh, this used to be a movie, but this is actually not going to play. Um, but this is essentially a still image of a of a double motion droplet. The the oil phase is very very thin um, because we we can tune that um, by varying uh, flow rate and things. Uh, but this is a, a, a uh, you know series of um, double motion droplets that basically come out at very very uh, high uh, speed, and we can collect them and allow the uh, oil phase to evaporate. And, uh, and when that happens, you can see a, a giant vesicle. So here is the top view and side view of a, of a vesicle. Uh, you can also see that they can phase separate. So if you use different uh, compositions of the lipid, uh, you can actually get these vesicle to phase separate based on the, 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 pr the properties of these uh, different lipids. And so it's a spherical vesicle, but some of the lipids are not fluorescent labeled. So you get these uh, uh, moon-like uh, shape here. So this is sort of the way we've been uh, doing some of our study in the, in the past of encapsulating uh, mammalian sulfur expression or bacterial sulfur expression into these uh, double motion uh, uh, droplets that eventually becomes uh, vesicles. So, um, so I'll share a, a sort of a quick story on the type of uh, synthetic cells that we build. So I talk about the, 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 the artificial platelet that's based on the mechanical input. And, and one of this uh, key feature of this um, synthetic Play that is is uh, is a use of a mechanical sensitive uh, ion channel called MSCL, uh, and this is a fascinating protein uh, to me. And basically, uh, if you apply membrane tension to a a, uh, a, a a you know this channel actually opens a pore. Okay, so this opens a pore about two and a half nanometers or so, and that's large enough for ions to cross for small molecules to cross. Uh, it's found in all bacteria. Uh, this one is from uh, from E. coli. And uh, it's, uh, it's a hormone pentamer. It's not selective, as I mentioned. Um, and it's actually used uh, in bacteria for, as a survival strategy. So if you imagine um, you know, uh, bacteria, you know, this is over a billion years of, of uh, evolution, that um, you know, when there's rain, the bacteria is going to have uh, turgor pressure. So water is going to uh, come in and essentially stretch a membrane. So if there is no such uh, 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 channels in the, in the bacteria, the bacteria will actually lice because of the, the turgor pressure uh, increases to a point where uh, the bacteria will just rupture. So these channels essentially serve as an emergency release valve so that when the channels are open upon high tension, uh, it can calibrate uh, essentially osmolites. So uh, ions and small molecule can basically be uh, transported across the bilayer in, in, in order to maintain uh, a turgor pressure that is um, that does not burst the, the bacteria cells. So, so my lab um, actually have um, um, uh, utilized these uh, mechanical sensitive channel in mammalian cells and actually have published a number of study on that. Uh, but we've also taken these mechanical sensitive channel and put them into vesicles, right? So to make mechanical sensitive vesicles. Um, so here's a, a, a early example of this. So we can encapsulate, uh, you know, um, DNA that basically encodes. Um, a molecule that can sense, and so I'll talk about this uh, biosensing component and also membrane active property. And basically, the biosensing is a is a fluorescent protein called GGECO, which is a, a calcium biosensor. And then um, the membrane active property is, is the mechanical sensing channel MSCL. So, um, so we can we can combine a, a sensing uh, uh, modality into into our our uh, synthetic cells here. Um, so this I've already showed you uh, in the earlier slides and that we essentially encapsulated E. coli uh, TXCL uh, that expresses MSCL. So this is a cascaded circuit that, uh, that Vincent's lab have, have uh, developed. And this MSCL incorporates in the membrane and uh, upon osmotic uh, pressure, the, the, the dye that's encapsulated would basically leak out. So um, I already showed this exact data uh, earlier. Um, so, the, uh, so what we can do with this is, as I said, we, we can uh, express uh, a biosensing component and uh, GGECO here, which senses uh, calcium and fluoresce. Uh, if you add EGTA, then basically it becomes uh, uh, non-fluorescent. And if you encapsulate uh, uh, GGECO along with uh, calcium, you will see that the, the vesicles are fluorescently 
uh, lit up. And if you, if you um, keep the calcium on the outside, so this is encapsulating the calcium and GECA go inside together. Uh, but if you keep that calcium outside and express the GECA, um, the, 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 the vesicles are, 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 are dark. Now, if you express the uh, MSCL as well, uh, along with the GECA, under isoosmotic condition, um, the vesicles are dark. And if you subject the vesicle to a hypoosmotic shock so that the membrane tension increases when water uh, influx occurs, then, uh, then you can get calcium influx to, to, to take place and that uh, will light up the vesicle. So if you, if you, um, if you think about this sort of uh, uh, strategy, essentially we demonstrate a, a artificial cell with an end gate. Uh, so the end gate here is, uh, there are two inputs, right? So one is the mechanical input that comes from osmotic pressure, right? So if you uh, don't have um, hypoosmotic shock, you just have the isoosmotic condition, there's no fluorescence. Uh, and the second input is a chemical input. So the, uh, the synthetic cell reports uh, the presence of extracellular calcium, right? So if there's no calcium outside, uh, the G-gecko will not light up inside. So, uh, and so this is a, a, a end gauge uh, scenario where you need to have both the mechanical input, the osmotic pressure, and the chemical input, the external calcium for the vesicle to, to fresh. Um, so, so we went on uh, further to take the same concept and ask, you know, what can we, uh, instead of having calcium to, to come in, uh, we can also use a, a, a inducible uh, circuits here. So um, I think all of you are probably familiar with um, the lac operon. So here we have a lac repressor and basically if influx of IPTG as an inducer will basically de repress uh, the, 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 the cascaded circuit and we'll basically be able to uh, report output gene here. and. Here we're using MREB, which is a, a homolog of actin uh, in bacteria. Um, so this is a, a amplifying inducible circuit and um, we're all, always expressing MSCL. So uh, in order for the IPPG to come in, uh, there needs to be osmotic shock, right? So, uh, so here uh, IPPG, if it's in the outer solution, we see no fluorescence and we can also uh, do a positive control of encapsulating IPTG in the, uh, uh, in the, in the, uh, in, in, in the GV and then you will see uh, MREB being made. Now, an interesting part is if we have a uh, hypoosmotic condition, so we can uh, have a condition where we don't have MSCL gene in the, in the synthetic cell. Uh, and if we subject a hypoosmotic condition, you know, we don't have any, anything made because um, even hypoosmotic condition, uh, the IPTG is actually impermeable to the synthetic cell. So you have no uh, fluorescent protein. Uh, whereas if you have hypoosmotic shot with MSCL, then you actually see a pretty uh, interesting uh, 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 behavior where the MREB that's produced actually uh, self-assemble as a ring uh, in, in, in the GV. And we have uh, videos of, of this uh, of the structure as well. And you actually see a, a ring formation uh, that's, uh, that's sort of a, a quite, quite neat, uh, almost like a cortex structure. Um, so, so that uh, that's uh, work that we also did in collaboration with Vincent uh, just um, uh, from last year. Um, and um, oh, I guess uh, here, hang on a second here. Okay, so so um, uh, I talked about uh, uh, membrane fusion earlier, and this is something that um, fits with the uh, with the um, uh, uh, the uh, the synthetic um, uh, uh, platelet idea, so that we needed the fusion to occur. And the minimum fusion machinery that um, you know you can you can reconstitute is using these uh, snare proteins. So there is the the B snare and the T snare, and these are the components that will make up each of the snares. So the the T snares uh, consist of syntaxin and SNAP25, and these are all membrane proteins. And the synthetic uh, brevin makes up the the B snare. So if you have two vesicles that uh, have these complementary snare, in the presence of calcium, they will actually undergo uh, membrane fusion. So this was our, our uh, fourth modules of membrane fusion. Uh, and I only have just a little bit of preliminary uh, result to, uh, to, to show you guys here where if we encapsulate or not encapsulate, we deposited, um, uh, you know, use our uh, super template uh, lipid coated beads and we can actually um, reconstitute uh, you know, the, the, the B snares onto lipid coated beads and we have the T snare reconstitute on the SUVs. In the presence of calcium, we can look at how memory fusion will occur in the different combination of T snare versus V snare. So, uh, and here you can see that, uh, and, and the SUVs are fluorescent labeled. So here you can see uh, docking of the, of the uh, SUVs onto the lipid coated beads. And, uh, and there was some non-specific uh, binding of the, um, of the SUV uh, with a T-snare to, uh, to, 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 a, to a bilayer that doesn't have V-snare, but if you have uh, the other cases, they're basically uh, you know, not there. 
So, um, so although I did not really describe the the, the uh, synthetic platelet <coughs> uh, concept, but this is essentially what we're going after. So just sort of uh, quickly illustrate that in, in, in this uh, part is that uh, we have the uh, artificial platelet that has to bind to an extracellular matrix, in this case, collagen. And uh, I've talked about uh, the mechanical sensitive channel MSCL, and that channel senses membrane retention. And the idea is that under uh, fluid shear stress, if this uh, vesicle is bound to the collagen, uh, the shear stress will actually induce the opening of MSCL, which allows calcium to enter. And calcium can then facilitate membrane fusions of SUV inside uh, the synthetic plate to, to outside. And this actually, uh, I did not describe discuss the mechanism, but this uh, essentially this process uh, we think could essentially uh, initiate the coagulation cascade. So um, uh, for this particular project, we still have a, a number of things to do is to test the shear activation MSCL. Uh, today, no one has actually tested whether MSCL can be activated through a shear stress mechanism. Uh, we have to think about reconstituting vesicle fusion from the inside. So this is uh, what we have done so far is to reconstitute a member fusion from a lipid coated B. And then we have to combine these modules together. So, um, so so I want to quickly summarize sort of the main uh, uh, slides we have. It, it hopefully convince you that self-expression is a versatile uh, strategy for reconstituting membrane proteins. Uh, we've talked about uh, the sum proteins and in, in that um, these uh, reconstitution of these sum proteins um, basically creates a solvent exposed sum domains and you can use it to uh, further reconstitute the, uh, the link complex. Um, so the sum one has three transmembrane domain and one peripheral membrane associated region. Uh, we also carry the same study for SUN2, um, which I did not uh, talk about. Um, so we have demonstrated that mechanical sensitive synthetic cells uh, couple sensing of osmotic stress to calcium influx, uh, and that can be used to induce a genetic circuit. And uh, oh, I did not talk about sort of uh, this part, but the idea that we have for uh, artificial platelet uh, is to use stress, uh, stress strength activation to couple to expression of uh, a negative charged lipid in order to activate the coagulation cascade in this negative charged lipid is uh, phosphoserine. Um, and, and again, this last part I did not really uh, touch on so much. So in the, in the remaining uh, a couple minutes, I, I wanted to uh, talk about a uh, just sort of a, a new uh, direction my lab has undertaken uh, that's really related to this, um, this group here on, on building synthetic cell. So when I ask, you know, uh, can we build a synthetic cell that couples light or biochemical input to electrical output, right? So I started the, the, the seminar asking, you know, we have 200 cell types in our body and what cell type would you like to build, right? So, uh, or what we want to build. So I, 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 we, we, for many, many years, we've been uh, focusing on the platelet as, as one cell type. And uh, more recently, we, uh, we, we started a new project uh, on trying to build a synthetic neuron, okay? So a neuron is a, uh, as you know, you have a, a, about 100 billion neurons in your brain, and uh, and it basically uh, takes in a, a, a chemical neurotransmitter and trans, you know, convert that into electrical signal uh, in the form of an action potential down the axon, and basically puts out another uh, biochemical output and secreting a neurotransmitter. So, uh, to me, it's fascinating to think about how a neuron processes information, and and can we can we build a synthetic cell that mimics that aspect of the work? So. Uh, I'll say that this work is in, in, in collaboration with uh, six other groups, um, and this is, was funded by the uh, National Science Foundation uh, Building a Synthetic Cell, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, grant. Um, so uh, besides myself, there's Cindy Tang, TJ Ha, Chang Li Rain, uh, Mo Das, um, uh, Barbara Hartorn, and Francois and Pierre. Um, and uh, so, so if you think about a a, a neuron, it has three uh, parts. There is the dendrite, which uh, basically has a ligate gated ion channel that binds the neurotransmitter. And that's essentially the initial uh, point where information is, is, is gathered. And uh, in the right, I'm displaying the, the, um, the membrane potential and showing you the actual potential, right? So the transmembrane uh, voltage in a resting uh, neuron is about minus 70 millivolt. But as the ion gated, um, oh, sorry, the ligand gated ion channel uh, opens, uh, you start to depolarize the membrane. And when it hits this minus 55, actual potential begins. So you have the uh, influx of uh, sodium from a uh, sodium gated, uh, voltage gated ion channel. And this basically raises the transmembrane to positive. So you start to depolarize. And when it hits about 40 millivolt, uh, the, another voltage gated ion channel becomes activated, the potassium voltage gated ion channel. And, uh, and potassium then can enter the uh, 
uh, you know, the neuron and, uh, and basically uh, polarizes the membrane again, and you have some hyperpolarization before it goes back to the resting potential. Um, and this action potential pro uh, propagates down the, the axon and then basically ends in the nerve terminal where you have the voltage-gated uh, uh, calcium channel that uh, opens and allow calcium to enter and you have the secretions of neurotransmitters. So it's a really um, fascinating process to me. They're somewhat modular, you know, so we can think about building a dendrite, we can think about building axon, we can think about building nerve terminal, and they can be constructed together. Perhaps we can essentially emulate a synth uh, synthetic neuron. So this team here, uh, some of us work on the sort of the bottom-up approach, and some of us are uh, focusing on, re, you know, engineering a neuron or engineering a non-neuron cell to basically uh, conduct uh, action potential and, and basically communicate in a, in a different form uh, than the cells that normally do. So, uh, so the way we conceive this from a bottom-up approach is, uh, is this grossly simplified uh, schematic here is if we can bu imagine building a synthetic cell that has compartmentalized ion channels, and you know, this would be a challenge of a cell, but imagine the possibility having sodium channel that enters, uh, uh, sorry, sodium that enters from uh, one part of the, uh, the synthetic neuron, and then once the action potential kicks off, then you have this uh, opening closing of, uh, of, of sodium and potassium, a voltage-gated uh, sodium and potassium channels, and then can propagate action potential downward. Uh, and, and if you think about how voltages are controlled within the cell membrane, it's all the action is done by these ion channels, right? Inside the cells, there's nothing that really uh, uh, would change or, or would basically, uh, that they can regulate, but they're not the, the main players of, 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 uh, of mediating these action, uh, these uh, uh, transmembrane potentials. So it's really just by uh, reconstituting uh, ion channels. So, uh, so this is my last slide just to share with you some, uh, or uh, last couple of slides just to share with you what we have done is we use the self-expression system I described uh, earlier. We can uh, essentially uh, spin down uh, and these, these uh, ion channels actually um, enter a compartment called the microsomes and that can be uh, pelleted down. Um, and, and the channels that we're uh, going after are these uh, voltage-gated potassium channel and a, a CARE 2.1, which is the inward rectifier potassium channels. Um, and, and, and you can find some of the channels in the pellet portion. So these are the, uh, the membrane portions of the self-expression system. You actually see a lot more with the CARE 2.1. And there's some additional bands here where we don't exactly know where they are. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you definitely see them in the supernatant, so it's not, uh, it's not 100% incorporating into the, into the, into the membrane, uh, but this is promising that we do see some membrane fraction. Uh, so then we can use the same approach to reconstitute this onto a super, uh, onto a super template. Uh, if you do this just for the GAP and we don't see any uh, fluorescence on the beads, uh, and then if you do it with the uh, RKB 1.2 and the Cure 2.1, we still start to see some fluorescence on the lipicoda B. They're not as strong as the sum protein that I showed you earlier, but they're, they're there. Uh, but we also work with uh, channel rhodopsin, uh, so we're interested in using light as a initiating uh, signal for the action potential. So uh, we're happy to see that we can also reconstitute uh, channel rhodopsin onto, onto this lipicoda B. And, uh, and we, we uh, tried this with a couple of different uh, membrane compositions. So what we're uh, currently using now is to, to, to um, uh, is try to characterize the function. So a couple platform that we're developing is, uh, so besides the vesicle, we're using uh, droplet interface by layer, which are basically two aqueous droplet in oil that if you form an interface, you can uh, uh, get a, a, a bilayer to form and we can uh, use electrophysiology to test the uh, function ion channels. Uh, similarly, you can also use a droplet hydrogel by layer, uh, basically the same concept, uh, but maybe easier to, to probe because everything is on the plane. Um, and, uh, and we've succeeded just to make a, a, a droplet interface by layer between two aqueous droplet uh, that has uh, dissolved fossil lipids. So in the interface, you form a bilayer. If you pass a triangular potential of plus or minus 25 millivolt, uh, essentially you can measure current, and this will be a capacitive current. And this current actually is, is the bilayer capacitance and it matches you know, pretty well with what we would generally expect. So roughly about 20 uh, picofarad. So this is where we're at with, uh, with, 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 with the synthetic neuron project and a lot of the things aren't going that we have to test the functionality, RKB, CARE 2.1 and the uh, channel rhodopsin. 
Uh, and then our goal, of course, is to try to reconstitute them into the into the giant vesicle with the hope that there might be a minimal composition uh, or uh, uh, compositions of ion channels that would allow, uh, you know, essentially making actual potential, right? We can take the, the giant vesicle and make it uh, uh, long and uh, slender and then basically activate it with light on one end and see if we can measure actual potential that propagates down the uh, this sort of artificial axon, so to speak. So that's the end of my, my presentations. I want to thank uh, my group. Uh, we, we had a, a socially, supposedly socially distance uh, 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 summer barbecue. I realized I saw it deep. Uh, my student did not wear a mask here. Uh, a lot of work I show here is uh, is done by um, a very talented graduate student, Sar Deep, who's now actually a, a staying as a postdoc for a year. Uh, Hossein and Alessandro uh, help with uh, the uh, work on the synthetic neuron projects and. Uh, and a lot of the work I introduced were uh, in collaboration with uh, Gan and, and, and Vincent. Uh, so Gan with the uh, the Sun Project and Vincent with all the uh, mechanosensitive vesicles and the rest of the folks with uh, the Synthetic Neuron Project. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Alan. That is awesome. You have a lot of questions in chat. Do you want to? Oh, is that right. Yeah. Sorry, I, I cannot see the chat at the same time. I'll ask you. No, uh, we, we usually don't do questions during okay. the talk because you can't see chat while you're talking. Exactly. So, uh, should I just go ahead and, and, and read them up? So, let's see. yeah, if you could read it before you answer, that's going to be yeah. for the recording. For sure, for sure. Yeah. So, uh, for most membrane proteins, do you need to make a membrane that has lipid that uh, may make biological composition natural cells, or can you use some unnatural modified endophilic polymers? It's a great question. So, uh, we're, 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 um, uh, the very, very nice question. So for the Sun Project, we actually use a composition that mimics the nuclear membrane. So we call this artificial nuclear membrane. And in, in, in Hosing's most recent work, he's tried uh, uh, brain polar extract and this artificial nuclear membrane. We are seeing some differences in the membrane composition. Uh, and generally for most of the work that we do in lab, we just use sort of standard DOPC cholesterol, uh, you know, sort of 70, 30%. Um, so, so, so I think the, the space of testing different membrane uh, composition is vast. And I think this is something that we are uh, definitely interested in. Um, since you mentioned about unnatural modified amphiphilic uh, polymer, we have a project on making, uh, essentially making peptide vesicles. And, and we are interested in seeing if there are uh, potential of using a hybrid vesicle of the lipid and, and, and peptide and so on. So uh, sort of different composition and try to reconstitute membrane protein in those, uh, in those uh, uh, um, I would say, you know, they're so vesicles. So, so uh, so a lot of uh, potential there to to use um, different uh, uh, different composition. Yeah. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. And I think we can also have a, a dialogue. I actually don't mind if people unmute themselves and, and talk about it. Um, so the second question is uh, from Daryl: Is when you when, when you do fluorescent measurements of samples with lipids, do you have to correct for light scattering of the lipid particles? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by lipid particles. If you're talking about the lipid coated beads. Um, so we, we, we usually, uh, uh, you, you know, use fluorescent label lipid for one, um, for one channel, and then we use a GAP, uh, you know, protein for, for a second channel. So, uh, and then we all obviously do our control, making sure they're, they're very minimal crosstalk. And, and generally, I'm not sure what light scattering, uh, you know, here would, um, would have an impact. So, um, yeah, but lipid particles, if you're talking about lipid particles outside, of the uh, of the lipid coated beads, then um, because they're they're lipid coated beads, we can wash them. So we actually do some washing in in uh, lipid coated beads, set them into the bottom of the slide, so we can just image the lipid coated beads. Uh, and then another question is, could you engineer from Daniel? Could, could you engineer proteins like someone to just have the active domain and remove all the hydrophobic domain, replace the hydrophobic domain with a chemical modification like lipid chain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, in a way, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. This is really, uh, this is actually something I, I you know, I'm, uh, I would say I'm very, very interested in doing is I think now we have a strategy to, uh, to make membrane proteins and, and, uh, and maybe some of you know about chimera antigen receptor or the synthetic receptor like uh, Synotch uh, that has a engineer uh, uh, transmembrane domain with, you know, uh, other parts are uh, exposed extracellularly. I think those are all very interesting. We can definitely try to do something like that with Sun. Um, but I think for the purpose of some protein, we have stuck with the full length um, uh, version and not uh, try to modify it. But certainly we can use different uh, transmembrane region, yeah. Uh, and then I think uh, I think the structure of membrane protein is affected by the phospholipid around them. Yeah, it is possible to predetermine the composition of membrane, yes. Um, yeah, so to determine the phospholipid 
uh, composition around the membrane protein is something that we, I, I don't even know how to do, uh, but we do use a sort of a mixture of, of membrane pro, uh, uh, lipids that, you know, we know, right? So as I mentioned earlier, we could use the artificial nuclear membrane composition, uh, you know, which has a mixture of different lipids. So we can do that. And I suppose if you, um, you know, for the ion channel, we know that certain ion channels require PIP2. So we can also, uh, when we do have this um, procedure worked out, we can try to do uh, different uh, with and without PIP2 or different uh, amount of cholesterol, for instance, and then actually see if that changes the uh, activity of the, of, the, uh, of the membrane protein. So I think membrane composition is an area that, that, is, that, is, uh, that is really, really interesting. Um, all right, so, um, so look at time. I hope this ends at one, right, normally? So I'll try to speak through the, the questions. It usually ends at one, yes. Okay, good, good. yeah, so I'll, I'll try to. Uh, and a question from uh, Alwyn. So when you generate vesicles by double motion, do you have oil residue in the membrane? Great question. So this is heavily uh, debated in the field. So, uh, you know, so, so I like to think there's very minimal oil. I, I obviously cannot say there's no oil. Uh, there, there are a few techniques that can actually um, uh, measure that, um, and, and we haven't actually tried that before, but I think it's worth doing is to, to see if there's any uh, residual oil residue. Um, one thing that I often um, like to bring up is when we use this strategy to make uh, the phase separate vesicle, we actually don't see, uh, we know the lipid can be fully segregated, that we see this moon shape. So uh, we know the lipid can be completely, uh, or at least the fluorescent lipid can be completely segregated. Uh, and you can still argue that there is there there is there's oil re, uh, remaining, um, but if you think about bilayer, there's a trans bilayer coupling. If there's an oil in, in in between, I'm not so sure how well it will couple. And if that's the case, then you might not see this moon shape, uh, uh, you know, um, phase separate vesicle. So when I first saw this moon shape vesicle, I was convinced that there is no oil in, in, in there. But it can again be uh, highly dependent on your 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 solvent in in in, uh, in the lipid. Uh, the next question is, do you, uh, do you do selection in the new membrane proteins too? Can this be done in synthetic cell at all? Great question. So uh, that's one of the future interests I have is try to think about using the synthetic cell as a platform for doing a selection of membrane protein. I haven't exactly figured out how to do that. Uh, I've discussed this with my postdoc uh, many times, and, and, and this is something that, you know, I, I'm imagining trying to, to engineer, let's say, MSCL, right, to have MSCL work differently. Uh, and basically use this as a platform for, for, uh, for evolving uh, membrane proteins. Um, I have to think more about this. How long can you run reaction inside a vesicle until you run out energy? So typically our, 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 um, our proteins are made with, uh, in about four to six hours. So they're not as robust as the, as the, uh, as the bacterial cell-free system. We also don't uh, do the same kind of feeding solution strategy. And perhaps we should try that to see if we can prolong the life of the, of the uh, mammalian cell-free system in uh, synthetic cells. Um, so, okay. Uh, what is the success rate for protein insertion into artificial membrane? In other words, how many proteins? Ah, great question. Um, so the first part of it, you know, my, my student will, 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 will say it's very frustrating. So when we try out the, uh, the, the proteins are different. So success rate for protein insertion um, with the SUN1 and SUN2, SUN2 especially, it incorporates really well. MSCL appear to incorporate pretty well. Uh, the recent work that we do with the ion channels that Hossein and Alessandro have done, uh, they haven't done so well. Uh, we, there's another mechanical sense channel that we're working with in the lab that appeared to insert okay as well. So I think it's very dependent on the type of, of, of uh, membrane protein. And ion channels, some of them uh, do form tetramer uh, and, and you know, it could be a lipid composition thing. Uh, we do get into the membrane, but they're not as robust as, as compared to some protein, yeah. Uh, we have not quantified the number of proteins inserted into uh, lipid-coated beads, but that's some, something that we should definitely, um, you know, uh, do in the future. Uh, the next question is, can the system be powered by some sort of synthetic organelle? <laughs> yes, great question. Yeah, yeah, uh, we have not done that, but this was on our radar. Uh, there were, there were um, um, interest in putting mitochondria into the synthetic cells and basically uh, see if we can prolong self expression there. It's a great, um, it's a great, uh, great idea. Um, we just don't have enough uh, people to work on these uh, different things. And, uh, oh, thanks, Scott. Uh, next question from Scott, who's 
actually I know. Uh, so we, uh, do the TXTL system affect membrane permeability in the absence of any channel proteins or do you see any permeability difference? Uh, no, so, so uh, you know, we, we always do our control. So our uh, simple control is without any uh, MSCL or without any channels. And generally there's no uh, leakage uh, just from the MSCL itself or from uh, just the TXTL system itself because there's no membrane within TXT, uh, TXTL system. Uh, lysate sources, uh, you know, the only two that we work with is bacteria and the HeLa, and um, I would imagine HeLa would have uh, a bit more membrane, endogenous membrane in there, um, but we have not really seen much of a difference from uh, as far as I can recall, yeah. Um, all right, sorry, I'm trying to speed through, oh, just three more, okay, so not too bad. Uh, uh, so the next question is, how do you control the directionality of ion channel in the membrane? Great, yeah, so uh, I did not really describe the mechanism of how this uh, occurs. So we have an unpublished um, work on this. So basically the, the, the transmembrane proteins are actually not inserted into the, into the lipid coated bead to begin with. They're actually uh, produced co-translationally into ER derived microsomes. I probably sort of said it uh, very briefly. Uh, in the HeLa lysate, they're actually a uh, small vesicle that remain in the lysate we can label them. We know they're from the ER. Uh, we, if we remove those uh, by ultracentrifugation, then it doesn't make any, um, you know, there's no membrane protein to be made. So it doesn't go on the lipid coated B. So what we believe is that these uh, membrane proteins are made in this uh, microsomes and the microsome themselves can actually fuse with the lipid coated B. And that's the way to introduce that. Uh, but if you think about the natural biology, any sort of a membrane protein insertion in the ER is generally 100% uh, accurate, right? 100% uh, uh, um, it happens sort of naturally. So, um, so, so that's that's the way it ensures the uh, orientations of the channel. Uh, oh, all right. So there's a oh scattering of the liposome. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So, so this was the question from Daryl earlier. Um, yeah, the liposomes actually are removed um, from from the because we can actually uh, spin down the the lipid coated beads and, and and basically remove any of the SUVs and, and things like that. Um, and then how does the super, uh, uh, super template change with osmotic pressure inside the cell? Super B. Okay, I guess I'm not sure if I understand that. Uh, how, how, sorry, how does the super B change the osmotic pressure inside the cell? Uh, I, I guess, actually, I, I, I don't, uh, uh, well, okay, so maybe just osmotic pressure. So when we treat this artificial cell with, with hypoosmotic con, uh, condition, the, the water will enter and that's how osmotic pressure are, are changed. Uh, the super, okay, so, so if I'm understanding correctly, so the super template does not, we use this just as a way to, uh, to, to produce membrane protein in uh, the vesicle, oh, sorry, not in the vesicle, in, in just the, the membrane itself. We actually don't do osmotic shock on the super template, okay? So because it's glass inside, there's no way for, uh, well, it's very difficult to, to generate osmotic pressure from a, from a lipid coated bead. Yeah. All right, so I guess we have two minutes left. I don't want to hold people uh, up. Um, so very quickly, I'm curious to know whether you can control the size of synthetic cell. Uh, um, yeah, ideally, yes. Um, and uh, But right now, because we're using this uh, new uh, technique called C-Dice, and, and we're not really coupling this to a droplet microfluidic approach, we're actually making a synthetic cell with a variety of sizes. <laughs> Uh, confusion of vesicles happen without involvement in snare proteins. Uh, not not if they're uh, not if they're just two bare vesicles. So if you uh, imagine making SUVs and you can you know have your SUV sit there for for a week, um, yes, there will be some aggregation that occurs. But fusion is a is a very very energetically unfavorable uh, process. So you do need to have uh, snare proteins, and there are other uh, strategy to fuse membrane. But uh, yeah, that won't get into. Um, can you, oh, great. Can you perform cryo EM on lipid coated beads? We're actually doing exactly that right now. Uh, but we're, we cannot do this on lipid coated bead, um, but we're trying to do this in the microsome itself because the lipid coated beads are too large for the cryo EM uh, to work. Oh, uh, okay. Is the membrane more vulnerable? Hmm. Uh, yeah, it's generally uh, fossil lipid bilayers are pretty fragile if they're large, if you're, if you're making large vesicle. Uh, for small vesicles, unless you... You, you add it to a, to a hydrophilic substrate so you can actually fuse. Otherwise, between two membranes, they're not, they're not easily fused. Uh, if you just have two membrane, um, uh, small vesicles, yeah. Oh my goodness, I'm not answering that many questions in a short time. So we are at one o'clock. Uh, I hope everybody is, uh, let me stop sharing the screen here. Uh,
I hope uh, this help with the question. So if you have any remaining question, feel free to send me an email. Uh, you know, this is a great, great group of, uh, of very focused uh, uh, group of, uh, of people uh, you know interested in synthetic cell. Happy to talk more if uh, uh, offline if you if you have inter interest. Thank you so much, Alan. That was an amazing question answering marathon. Yeah, but <laughs> I got to everybody. I think. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you, everyone, and thank you so much, Alan, for finding the time and giving a great talk and see you all next week. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, everybody. Bye. Take care. All right. See you.